I'm very glad to be here, and Clara is reasonably glad to be here too. And um, I must say, uh, experiences from Belgium, I must have tell you that my first surgical experience, I'm a medical person, was during an internship in Salgrenska, Schukhuset, in Göteborg. And uh, I was uh, halfway medical school then, and very, very honored to be allowed to the emergency department during the weekend. And during the weekend, as you may know, uh, ships go out from Göteborg Harbor with people on board for, for cheap, uh, cheap liquor. And so on Saturday evening, or was it Sunday evening, they come back with lots of uh, injured people who fall down gangways on the, on the ship. And uh, so I, my, my very first patient, I, I was allowed... Okay. My very first patient I was allowed to sew up, well, had a bad cut on his head, he'd fallen down after too much drink, and happened to be a, an American student. Uh, and as he was lying there and I was sweating and you know doing my very first stitches, uh, he said, oh, uh, young person, oh, those are my first stitches. And <laughs> And then the nurse, you know, one of those emancipated Swedish uh, big-mouthed uh, girls said, uh, Hans Oxo. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going to be about experiences, exp the experience in Belgium of uh, liberal legislation for euthanasia. So this work, of course, is teamwork, and this is the end-of-life research group, uh, care research group, and also an uh, indebted to the, pres the current president of the Federation Palliative Care Flanders and to the past president, uh, who is also now the president of the Life and Information Forum, euthanasia doctors, you could say. There are um, of physician-assisted dying, uh, there are three uh, direct uh, cases. One is euthanasia, which is by definition upon explicit request by the patient. The other is doctor assist assisted suicide. And the third is life abbreviation uh, without uh, explicit request from the patient. Those are the three um, radical uh, life and information uh, life and actions and here is to summarize things the situation in australia and new zealand i do not have figures for uh, sweden but i'm told they exist and here for belgium in 1996 and 2003 for australia and belgium in 1998 before the legislation and in which was in 2002 and in 2007, uh, <coughs> what you see is that the uh, overall incidence of all deaths, among all deaths of uh, uh, a medical intervention, which was likely or possibly or certainly abbreviating life survival, that was very high in all countries. What you see, this is the overall epidemiological picture, the evolution of things over the years, before and after the legislation. And the main dif you see that the, the total incidence of uh, life abbreviation by the physician is a bit similar in the different countries and it's not significantly changed since the law. It has not increased, but the two major categories have uh, changed. Euthanasia proper, which is upon request, has, was high also in Australia, which has still has no legislation, and uh, euthanasia has increased almost doubled in Belgium. At the same time, 
life abbreviation without specific request has halved. So the major impact epidemiologically of the legislation has been to change, to move cases from life in terminal life abbreviation by the physician at his initiative but without a request from the patient to the same thing but upon the request of the patient and I must add earlier not in the extreme agony of uh, what it was before the legislation. This has been the, made the most important change. This was to summarize uh, the situation and now we'll get into the meat of the uh, next slide please yes what you see these are the questions I propose to address first I want to sh uh, tell you more about the belt what I call the Belgian model of integral end-of-life care then we'll ask the history of how it came about say two third we'll ask the question whether there was anything like a so-called slippery slope, namely uh, w whether the legislation brought about undesirable and undesired and unexpected evolutions. How did end-of-life practice evolve under the law? The fourth question will be how do palliative care and le legal euthanasia interrelate? <coughs> Are they antagonistic, as most people believe in most, most parts of the world, or are they, as Belgians now know, synergistic? And then a few take-home messages. Now this is Benelux. Uh, it's very small, but there's quite a crowd there. Uh, almost 20, 28 million people or so, 26. And the Netherlands were the first. The Netherlands were the first to uh, to regulate euthanasia, namely already in the uh, in uh, as of 1990, where there were agreements, discussions, and agreements between the judiciary, the legal system, and the medical profession, uh, and where it was agreed that euthanasia, that is life ending upon request, would not be prosecuted if it were carried out according to a number of carefulness guidelines. And these same carefulness guidelines eventually uh, came to be written into the law in 2002. And it is also in 2002 that Belgium enacted the um, a, youth, a similar, very similar euthanasia law, and finally Luxembourg. The question is, is Belgium a laboratory for things to come elsewhere in the world? Possibly. A definition of euthanasia is that it is intentionally terminating the life of a person by another person at that first person's request. So euthanasia is by definition voluntary euthanasia. And it is legal under Belgian law if, one, there is a repeated, consistent request under no external pressure or coercion in writing and when A person wishes to express her wishes for her end of life in the case she would be incompetent, for instance comatose, then these wishes can be expressed in writing and uh, they are advance directives. These wishes must come from a competent adult person who must be suffering suffering in two ways, intolerably and irreversibly, so that it, there is no chance that this suffering 
would improve and become tolerable. So you notice intolerable is really the competence of the patient. It is the patient who must find something intolerable and it is the physician who must decide that it is irreversible. So this is really joint decision making by patient and physician. It must be caused by an irreversible medical condition, sick, sickness. And the, the patient must, according to the law, be duly informed of alternatives to euthanasia, namely including palliative care. And it must be carried out by a medical doctor, no one else than a medical doctor, who that doctor must consult the nursing staff, the nurses, and a competent colleague. Another medical doctor must be consulted who must ascertain, also concur, that the condition is irreversible and that the other conditions for the law are met. Uh, if the patient is not expected to die within the foreseeable future, then uh, a, another medical doctor must be uh, consulted and a moratorium, uh, uh, it, they must wait for a month before carrying out the euthanasia. Uh, the re this is what occurs usually by uh, when the case is a case of motor neuron disease, se severe uh, degenerative neurological diseases such as multiple sclerosis or amyotrophic uh, lateral sclerosis. Then uh, the patient may is not going to die within the foreseeable future. He might live on for in, as in fact for years in a wretched situation but then when that patient requires requests euthanasia that must be can be done only after one month of reflection and then all cases must be reported to a national control and evaluation commission the principles which underlie this legislation are procedural ethics meaning uh, they are not uh, prescriptive ethics or normative ethics the ethics of the the, the ethics of the uh, legislation are that uh, are to ensure uh, the, to ensure that no ethical principles are violated in the procedure that is done by fixing a definite procedure on how to proceed on with such a decision. So there's two in, uh, organizations in Belgium which deal with this. One of is organizations for the end of life. One is the uh, Palliative Care, uh, Federation of Palliative Care Services, and the other is the Life and Information uh, Physicians, LEIF, who are a group of physicians but also nurses and, and professionals who are in the service, at the service of, the, of colleagues to come and help with euthanasia because of course euthanasia is still a very rare event and very few doctors are, have, any, have experience and, mo and too many doctors do not know the law too well. The Federation of Palliative Care for Flanders, that's the northern and Dutch-speaking part of Belgium, took euthanasia on board, accepted euthanasia. And it is, so far, the only palliative care organization in the world which has explicitly adopted uh, euthanasia procedures. What it says is that palliative care and euthanasia are neither alternatives 
nor antagonistic. Euthanasia may be part of palliative care. However, caregivers in the palliative care service are entitled to ethical limitations. They can say, not me, don't ask me. But if they do not want to uh, participate in euthanasia, they must say this ahead of time, in due time to their patients, so that the patients can then ask to be taken care of by someone else than someone who refuses to carry out euthanasia. This is the official position of the palliative care organization in Flanders. Is this so far unique in the world that a palliative care organization takes on board euthanasia? Is this an oddity of Belgium? Well, there are oddities in Belgium. You know, this is the detour in Dutch and a detour in French. So there are odd things in Belgium. But this is the idyllic situation in the, uh, with palliative care patients. This is the daycare center for palliative care of my Free University of Brussels uh, University Hospital. And in these same buildings, are the headquarters, both of the Federation of Palliative Care and of the Life and Information Forum, Euthanasia Doctors. So, what is now this Belgian model of end-of-life care? What are its concepts? Well, integral end-of-life care, if you see it like this, is, consists of conventional palliative care and euthanasia, but they overlap. And if you look at all deaths, about 30% of all deaths in the country go through palliative care. And of those, 1% of all deaths, so a small minority, ends up having euthanasia by the ministrations of palliative care. And another 1% dies with euthanasia without having been in contact or having involved palliative care. So this is the overall situation. And I suggest, oh, even better, I suggest to call this palliative care, which has taken on board euthanasia, I suggest to call integral palliative care. So if you now consider uh, the not the concepts, but the personnel and the organization. The physicians involved in palliative care are palliative care physicians. And then there are next to that the life and information forum physicians. And of course, other physicians, general practitioners, oncologists, neurologists, etc., who might be members of both life and information or palliative among the palliative care physicians. So there's a a major overlap between the different concepts and also the different groups of physicians. But is this an oddity of Belgium? Well, we must remember that Dame Cicely Saunders, who founded the palliative care movement in the United Kingdom in the 1950s, 60s, that uh, she was quite explicit that the whole idea of palliative care was to prevent euthanasia. If you had, the idea was, if you have good palliative care, there will be no need for euthanasia. So that the situation in Belgium is totally different. In, in fact, we'll end up with the conclusion that we have created palliative care in Belgium for one of the reasons was in order to make euthanasia possible. The and let's look at the foundations of palliative care and legal euthanasia. Um, clinically, uh, palliative care is of course about the relief of suffering and the prevention of medical futility, futile medical treatment which is senseless given the situation. For euthanasia, there's also, of course, relief of suffering, but that here it's a prevention of palliative futility, keeping someone alive who 
no longer wishes to be kept alive, palliative futility, which is a novel notion. The ethical priorities are beneficence, first, in palliative care, and respect for patient autonomy. Those are the major uh, ethical uh, values served. And for euthanasia, they're the same, but probably in a different order. There is a priority to patient autor autonomy, and beneficence is understood to be the respect of the patient's autonomy. That is being beneficent uh, in euthanasia. The life stance of the advocates is often religious for palliative care and is most often uh, agnostic or atheistic among the advocates of euthanasia. The potential <laughs> <coughs> for abuse is palliative futility, is <coughs> going on with palliative treatment when a patient no longer wants it. And the potential for abuse in euthanasia, and we'll deal with that, is the slippery slope and to be euthanasia to be a substitute for palliative care. Uh, the danger being that, oh, we need no good care for the uh, terminally ill because we have euthanasia. The public support is universal for palliative care and there's vast majorities in most advanced countries and it, they are still increasing. This is just a graphic representation in many countries for the evolution of the public support for legal euthanasia, as you can see. In all, all, in all advanced countries, the support among the public is increasing. Now, that is not the, the support for euthanasia is absent in among the European Association for Palliative Care uh, organization and its members. There, they, the official positions were uh, the official positions were blanket rejection uh, on a basis of essentialistic uh, motives. They considered uh, in 1995 that there was a fundamental irreconcilable antagonism between the ideas of palliative care and legal euthanasia. However, in 2003, the position was a little bit more restrained. And they said, and the author of, the, um, of this paper, position paper, was Dr. Matel Stvet from Norway. Uh, they said that euthanasia should not be part of the responsibility of palliative care. You know, uh, we do not we do not touch euthanasia with a pole. It's outside of, of our uh, interests. And the reasons were more pragmatic. The reasons were, we don't want, we will not do euthanasia if someone wa else wants to do it, but not us, uh, because we worry about slippery slope effects. If there's legislation, we'll end up in places where we don't want to be. And second, Euth uh, euthanasia law would impede, would hinder the development of uh, palliative care. It would be used to to avoid investments in palliative care. So these two issues, those those two major arguments uh, against legal euthanasia, are what was investigated extensively in the Netherlands and Belgium, and I will show you the results of. So the slippery slope effect that is most, most understandably dreaded by opponents of legal euthanasia is, of course, life ending without explicit request. In fact, as you saw before, which is a, a situation which does occur in all countries which have no law on euthanasia, but so this fear of uh, life abbreviation of patients who have not requested this is, is nicely uh, shown in the following cartoon. This is 
euthanasia without consent, right? And this man says, over my dead body, right? right. Next question. How did this law on euthanasia come about in, in Belgium? Well, it was quite different in Belgium from the Netherlands. Don't try to read this in any detail. But what you see here is the history between 1980 and nowadays. And in green are the milestones uh, on the way to legal euthanasia. And in uh, orange, the milestones in the development of the palliative care system in Belgium. So it's the, the palliative care system started in Belgium in 1979 or 80 uh, at our initiative at the Free, Free University of Brussels, which is, um, some of you might know, a university which is uh, really something like the antidote to the Catholic University of Leuven. It is a university specifically dedicated to, quote-unquote, free thought and free inquiry. So it's a secular, explicitly secular university. But we took the initiative of going and seeing what palliative care was in the United Kingdom, and we were quite impressed. And we created a first organization in Brussels, which was called the CCC, Continuing Care Community. And it must be said that this was the first initiative outside of the United Kingdom in <coughs> continental Europe. And our objectives right from the start were we, we, we want palliative care because of its intrinsic value, but also because we consider palliative care uh, uh, to open the possibility to have legal euthanasia. Because if you do not have correct palliative care, you will never be able to legalize euthanasia because for good reasons, people will object to that, uh, to euthanasia without the possibility of palliative care. So this organization, Continuing Care Community, uh, was created with this double objective. Uh, we regretted having called it Continuing Care Community, CCC, because we made, in the media, we made only a very modest impact in the media, but people who did make uh, a major impact in the media, who called themselves also CCC, were the Cellule Communiste Combattante. <laughs> and, uh, they blew up, uh, the, they put bombs at the headquarters of NATO and they were a rather disreputable bunch. So we abbreviated the name to Continuing Care and we lived on in peace. Uh, another major milestone was here, a report by the so-called uh, Governmental Advisory Council <coughs> on bioethical matters. This was <coughs> a committee very pluralistically constituted with, um, with uh, respected philosophers or ethicists or representatives of the different uh, religions and also representatives of the uh, secular, secularist, humanistic organizations, we, uh, who, we, who came up with a report telling Parliament, telling the Belgian people and the government that they had four alternatives with end-of-law issues. Either they could keep euthanasia in the, in the law as murder, not change, or they could totally, oh, thank you, yes, or they could totally liberalize it. Very good. They could liberalize it completely. And in between, two other alternatives were to regulate it. And you could regulate it before the fact. Namely, you could, candidates for euthanasia would have to pass an exam. And it, uh, euthanasia, there would be a, a priori regulation of euthanasia. Or, 
it could be a posteriori regulation. In other words, it, euthanasia could be carried out, but the physician who carried it out must justify himself, must be accountable and report the case, and the case would then be judged, be re reviewed by a competent body. And in case there was something not uh, clear in the report, then only an investigation would be carried out. And then the doctor would be called to that body and would have to justify his actions if it, they were not completely uh, according to the law. So those were the four options that were given to the, the polity, to the uh, community, and Belgian Parliament, which then had, for the first time, a left-of-centre majority government uh, adopted the a posteriori regulation option, which gave us the law that we have, and which is very, very similar to the law in the Netherlands and uh, Luxembourg. You also see that the budget for, uh, for palliative care in 2002 was doubled, because what really happened is that there were th three bills at the time in 2002, within a few weeks, passed by Parliament, patient rights bill, euthanasia bill, and the bill expanding palliative care to cover the whole country, and every hospital had to have a palliative care unit, and every Belgian person must have access to palliative care services in the home, and therefore the budget was doubled. So this was a package, right? This all came together. It must be said that a peculiarity of Belgium is the confidence of the people in the healthcare system. Uh, before the law, it was quite high. It was the highest in Europe. And after the law, and this is rather important, because one of the major objections of the medical profession against legalizing euthanasia, their objection is that, uh, and it is an understandable but unjustified uh, objection, is that euthanasia might undermine the confidence that people have in their in the medical profession. The people might worry that when a doctor uh, comes in, he might be their killer. Uh, so, if anything, the confidence in the medical profession has increased still after the legislation, and it is the highest in Europe. This is according data from the European Values Study. On the, uh, still in the history, regulatorily, in other words, the regulating bodies, uh, I emphasize again that uh, the uh, three laws were passed together by the Belgian Parliament. The, the, the Belgium linked palliative care and euthanasia and patient rights. The Belgian Medical Disciplinary Board issued guidelines, joint guidelines for euthanasia and palliative care, which are considerable, considered really a little bit inseparable. And then, you've seen that slide before, that was the taking on, on board of physician-assisted death which is essentially euthanasia, by palliative care in Belgium. And interestingly, uh, although the medical prof part of the medical profession, part of the medical profession was opposed to legal euthanasia, and certainly uh, the major part of the clergy and of the church, which in Belgium is mainly the Catholic Church, so, uh, many of them, turned around after the legislation. And this is interesting because it suggests that this man, for instance, is a, a, a colleague, a doctor, and he's head of palliative care service. He's also a Jesuit priest. And he says here that when I, he, he comes around to recognizing that euthanasia can be a good thing. Uh, he wrote a book against euthanasia before. 
And the interesting thing is that uh, we all agree that laws are the accomplishment of evolutions, of shifts in the culture among the public in democracies. And so, so they are for sure. But also, laws can change uh, the, the, the culture. After a law is enacted, that ends up changing the culture. Another example of this is that the majority in the UK, per, of the people in the UK, wanted to keep the death sentence. The death sentence was abolished by politicians who took the lead and then the majority of the people turned against the death sentence. It's an interesting interaction between uh, the people and the law. We get to the next se section, is wha was there evidence of slippery slope? How was the evolution of practices under the law? And this is the most difficult part for you because there's lots of statistics, but we don't have to go in all the details. But I owe you the data, and those of you who are interested can look them up. And those are epidemiological studies which were published in very prominent uh, journal, medical journals. And let's uh, remind you the terminology. Medical end-of-life decisions are all decisions which may have or, cer may or certainly have a life-shortening effect. And there's three major categories. There's physician-assisted dying, and we saw that, which is euthanasia, physician-assisted suicide, and life ending without request. Then there is another category, much milder, is intensified alleviation of pain and symptoms by increasing, increasing doses of drugs, but which might have, uh, possibly have, a life shortening effect, which is, for instance, a position which is not, uh, which is uh, admitted in fact, encouraged by, for instance, the Catholic Church. And then there are non-treatment decisions, that is, withholding or withdrawing, possibly life-prolonging uh, medical treatments. Those are the three major groups. This is what was investigated. How did these uh, practices change between before and after the euthanasia law? And then there's a, a last category, which is so continued deep sedation, which is administering sedative drugs to keep the patient in a deep coma until his death. And that can be done either with, while still giving fu fluid, and, uh, and in that case, the, the, the abbreviation of life is uncertain. What happens is that the patient eventually dies, that's the idea of the underlying disease, uh, but he's no longer conscious and he no longer suffers. But it can also be done without giving artificial uh, flu fluid and food, and then oh, I propose to call it slow euthanasia. That is a category apart because uh, apart from this being done, uh, the case might also have been one of, um, of uh, uh, discontinuing treatment or of increased uh, pain and symptom alleviation. So this is a category apart, but which is very, has become very important because in, uh, certainly in the Benelux countries, but I'm I'm sure also in your country, this is the option which is preferred by physician instead of uh, euthanasia, and they apply it more and more. Uh, I'm not sure it is the solution which is preferred by the patients. We do not know this too well. It certainly is preferred by physicians, and it is very much practiced in palliative care settings. This, I think you've this is another rendition of a slide that I showed you in the beginning. These are the percentage end-of-life decision 
before and after the law, and here the statistical difference, significance, euthanasia doubled, physician-assisted suicide remained very, very rare. That really is not uh, a preference of patients, obviously. You may know that this only is uh, legal in a few states in the United States, Oregon, Washington States, Montana, uh, but obviously in the Netherlands and Belgium, this is not what patients want. And then there's life ending without request, which so which was reduced after the law, and the total number of life ending decisions did not change really. So that terrifyingly, before the law, because there was a threat that the physician applying uh, euthanasia could be brought to court and charged with murder, a patient who was suffering, uh, in the worst case, before the law, a patient was more likely to die suffering intolerably if she asked for euthanasia than if she didn't. Because if she asked for euthanasia, that would be known to the nursing staff or the family, and there was a risk that uh, a physician might be uh, indicted. Uh, and, but if she didn't ask, if the patient did not ask, then the physician felt, felt assured enough to abbreviate life. So this is, interestingly, the change is, has been a change in major, not so much in practices as in the ethical uh, context in which these end-of-life practices are done. So a change towards patient autonomy is the major impact. There's another uh, important thing, is that the carefulness of the decisions. Decisions, end-of-life decisions in general, are more discussed with family, with patient, of course, but also with family, with colleagues, with nursing staff. And this is uh, the family, for instance, is much more involved in the end of life now than before the law. So the law has improved, uh, also the law on patient rights has improved the, um, the uh, procedural uh, ethics of the end of life. And very importantly also, uh, here, the alleviation of pain and symptoms has increased very significantly since the law. So what, we're, what this is, for instance, typically the work of palliative care services. Palliative care, the tenets of palliative care have been boosted, have been uh, encouraged very much by the legislation. And the legislation has mainly changed the ethical uh, the autonomy, uh, was is much more respected since the law. So, no slippery slope. On the contrary, maybe there was a slippery slope before the law, but if anything, the law has changed, has moved up the situation up the slippery slope of, uh, in ethical terms. So, the conclusions are that the law was followed by an increase in all types of medical end-of-life decisions, except life ending without request, which was substantially reduced. The tenets of palliative care were increasingly applied. For instance, there was a substantial increase in terminal sedation. And we can further illustrate this by the following slides. Uh, you want to know who received euthanasia, how many cases were there, and where was that? How many cases? Well, um, almost 2% of all deaths in Belgium. There are in Belgium 10 million easy. Belgium is an easy country in many respects. It has 10 million inhabitants and there are 100,000 deaths and 2% are with euthanasia. So that's about 2,000 per year patients uh, receive euthanasia. This is much more easier than for the Netherlands with very complicated figures, but the same, same percentages. So let's see an analysis of euthanasia cases that were reported to the federal control 
<coughs> and evaluation <coughs> commission. <coughs> the total number of cases which were reported since the law in 2002 keeps increasing. And interestingly, we'll discuss this over drinks later this afternoon, maybe. But the number are quite different between the Dutch Flemish speaking northern part of the country, which is about half of the population, and the French speaking part. They carry out euthanasia almost probably a little bit less than in Flanders, but they don't report it. As for the diagnosis of the patients, when the patients were terminally ill for euthanasia, they were almost always cancer cases. When they're not terminally ill, they were usually neuromuscular disease, such as multiple sclerosis. The suffering was, when they are terminally ill, was essentially physical, but also, very importantly, mental. And among the non-terminally ill, quite a few of them did not suffer physically. One third did not suffer physically, obviously, but uh, the majority, the vast majority, suffered mentally. So you could see the indication for euthanasia is not, of course, not only physical suffering. It is suffering. There's more euthanasia in cancer. This 83% of euthanasia carried or reported euthanasias are cancer, whereas it's only one quarter of all deaths are caused by cancer. So cancer is definitely overrepresented among euthanasia uh, recipients. As for the age of the patient, this is important because you remember or you are aware that uh, one of the major objections against legal euthanasia is the fear of slippery slope effects in the worst, is that vulnerable patients, vulnerable pa people, uh, the uneducated or the very elderly would be quote unquote eliminated in a country with a liberal uh, euthanasia law. Well, let's look at the age, and you can see that the, among the elderly, the elderly over 80 years are underrepresented among people who receive euthanasia. Euthanasia tends to be more in younger uh, patients. So this is the this is the uh, the general population. So 50% of deaths occur after 80 years, and only 18% of uh, elderly receive euthanasia. So this invalidates this concern that uh, euthanasia would be statistically used uh, to eliminate elderly. The place of death is uh, in blue, the hospital, in yellow, the home. And only less than a quarter of people die in their own house, in their own home, uh, among the general public. But it's double that for euthanasia. So euthanasia is a practice which is carried out more often, uh, much more often, in the patient's home than uh, when the death is not by euthanasia. And uh, half of euthanasia cases are practiced by general practitioners in the home of the patient. Very f little euthanasia in care homes, right? Or in uh, elderly people care homes. And that is mainly before, because all, because although about a quarter of the people die in an elderly care home, that is because many of these patients in care homes are no longer competent and therefore cannot or no longer do either do not ask for euthanasia or if they ask for it, it cannot be uh, honored because they are no longer 
competent because of mental uh, degradation like Alzheimer's disease. So euthanasia is more at home and seldom in nursing homes. Uh, <coughs> in conclusion, euthanasia is increasingly reported. Uh, you should note that the life abbreviation is goes estimated life abbreviation how how much shorter has your patient lived uh, because of euthanasia well between one day to several years but in the vast majority of cases it is less than a week and it's more at home by general practitioners in cancer in younger patients in the higher educated vulnerable patients it's very important are underrepresented among the recipients of euthanasia. So there is no evidence for abuse, there is no evidence for slippery slope. Relationship between physician-assisted death and palliative care, how did they interact, antagonism or synergy? Well, this is looking, <coughs> but we'll skip that, this is looking at whether the patient, uh, the physician differences between physicians trained in palliative care and not trained. And it turns out that physicians trained in palliative care do not practice euthanasia any less than the others. In fact, if anything, they practice it more. And you can see this better here. Uh, this is the distribution of deaths in when not, no palliative care was used. And this is where palliative care was used. And you can see that there's explicit life-ending practices are much more frequent in palliative care than when uh, there is no palliative care. For euthanasia, for instance, which is here in, in green, euthanasia is twice more frequent in a palliative care setting than in a in when not palliative care is not involved. So this is saying that uh, there is absolutely the contrary to antagonism between palliative care and euthanasia. In fact, if anything, palliative care practices more euthanasia than general care. Also, the spiritual and, exper uh, and existential uh, care for the dying person is much more intense when there is uh, euthanasia than when not. In fact, 16 times more intensive spiritual and existential care that includes, of course, religious uh, ministrations, usually that is by ministers of the faith, uh, when there is euthanasia. So again, this suggests that there is no antagonism between religious faith and uh, requesting and receiving euthanasia in Belgium. And interestingly, this is the graph with the participation of uh, scientists from all these different countries in uh, the European Association for Palliative Care Conferences. And what you see is that Southern Europe, very little participation, and Belgium has the um, highest participation per capita, in meaning uh, in, <coughs> in relation to its uh, size, uh, in these conferences. And very close to the Netherlands and your country, Sweden. So these are the three countries with the highest participation in uh, palliative care conferences. And in, if anything, Belgium has the highest. So again, this suggests that there is no antagonism between palliative care and legal euthanasia. On the contrary, those are a few literature references that you can use. So in conclusion, euthanasia and other life terminating medical decision are part and parcel of palliative care in Belgium, although not practiced by some palliativists, who then 
uh, who refuse to do that. They don't want to touch it with the pole, but they have to tell the patients in advance. There's an interesting comparison between <coughs> the history of abortion and euthanasia. <coughs> the International Federation of Gynecologists uh, rejected abortion until 98 as the European Association of Palliative Care rejected uh, palliative care uh, until 95. And now the FIGO, International Association, <coughs> has taken abortion on board for both ethical, ideological reasons, reasons of autonomy of the woman, but also for practical reasons. Uh, the, uh, the FIGO <coughs> says uh, that abortion is a right, but it also says, besides that, it should be done properly and professionally to avoid, of course, uh, the dramatic abortion situations that existed in the past. So both ideological but also practical reasons. And I suspect, I would predict that in the future, the a similar attitude will sometime be adopted by palliative care organizations. <coughs> the take home messages, just to rub it in very briefly, is that there is no paradox. If Dame Cicely Saunders, who founded palliative care, developed <coughs> palliative care to prevent euthanasia, then in Belgium we've developed palliative care to enable euthanasia. Let's get this one. Is this, is this experience of interest to other countries? I think it is, and I would add a personal comment that euthanasia, physician-assisted death, is one more manifestation of taking control over our lives. We're taking control over reproduction, over birth, over disease. Uh, we're taking control over the end of life now, too. This is obviously progress of humanity. And it's also a shift away from interest in survival to quality of life as the principal motive of human behavior. And this is what I do with my other hat. I try to measure quality of life. And this is uh, notoriously difficult. And I would suggest that quality of life is difficult to measure. But when you see it, you know it. Like here, right? Right. This is. Uh, it's taken more time than most of us planned, but I, I did not see you bored. I think, and uh, I, I thank you for your attention and thank you for having me here. Well, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, questions? Uh, my name is Anders Nessel. I found you from France three days ago. I wrote, you heard Anders Nessel, and I called us via telephone for three days. Um, I wrote an article in, in the Physiotherapist, the monthly, Swedish monthly in 1976 and most of us who are here present and active in RTVD have been called fascists, Nazis, sadists, we don't know what we're talking about, etc. Uh, but what I would like to um, ask you about is the, or comment, is the slippery slope. Why do I want to comment here? What do you say now on Swedish? Slutande planet. Um, in France, where I am active in the sister organization, in Frankrike, where I am active in the uh, sister organization, um, the French uh, Aneth Anesthesian Association, the French uh, 
narkos, tack, narkos uh, 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 gives a figure of about uh, 10 to between 10 and 15,000 anger denna förening uh, narkosläkarföreningen anger uppskattar till mellan 10 och 15 tusen uh, secret uh, under the table euthanasias per year. Alltså uppskattat till mellan 10 och 15 tusen uh, hemliga under bordet eutanasier per år. What is that if not a slippery slope? Yes. Um. Absolutely. Uh, that's uh, this figure. Interestingly, I don't know exactly how they can estimate it, but 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 this type of investigation, epidemiological investigation, was done with very very solid methodology in uh, several countries, including the Netherlands and Belgium, and this is where the figures of 1998 that I showed you come from. In Belgium. Um, 15,000 in France, which has over 50 million, that's about five times more than Belgium. That would give for Belgium about 3,000. And that is exactly what we found in Belgium before the law. And that has decreased since the law. So the major impact of the law was to reduce uh, mercy killing by doctors, you know, in clandestine and often not too professionally well done. So the, France was not among the countries in which this was officially uh, investigated, but I'm not surprised, and this estimate is, is very reasonable. Yes. Uh, my name is Ellis Wallner. I have uh, several questions. I'll just ask a couple of the more important ones. Uh, one thing, I heard a speech here by a Dutch uh, physician, also very prominent in this field, about four or five years ago in Stockholm. And one thing he mentioned that I really took home with me was that the incidence of suicide among elderly people had reduced in Holland as a result of the legislation. That people felt more confident that they would be taken care of in a proper way at the end of life. I wonder if you have a similar experience with this. Uh, a second question is, you didn't mention the family. You talked about the patient having signed something in advance or at the time and so on. Does the family, the immediate relatives, have any important role to either uh, stop euthanasia or to push it forward? And a third thing is, besides religious groups and within the medical profession, Self, the opposition to euthanasia. Uh, what about the handicap groups? That's one of the major opponents in Sweden, are handicap associations that are worried that what the effects would be. Yes, the first question related to suicide. I have no, I have no figures in mind in Belgium. Uh, I can tell you that the rate of suicide is, is, is quite high in Belgium too, as in fact as in most uh, advanced countries. And uh, there's many ways to look at this and uh, there's very sad aspects to this, but it is also in one way a manifestation of autonomy, isn't it? So, no, I do not know whether the legislation on euthanasia has had an impact on uh, the rate of suicide. Frankly, uh, if it had had a major impact, I would guess I would have heard about it. So I believe it hasn't. Uh, I'm not sure. The second question related to the role of the family. <clears throat> it is absolutely clear that the law is absolutely clear that it is the patient, of course, who has the, the first and the last say in these matters. Uh, however, of course, uh, the, 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 the legislator does mention, mention that it is advisable that this be in harmony with the family. Uh, let me tell you that from experience, from 
my own, but, but also from, I hear from many colleagues, uh, oftentimes the patient asks for euthanasia and the family is reluctant. Uh, the, uh, and the defenses of the family must be sort of overcome uh, before euthanasia can be carried out. Uh, this is important because uh, one legitimate concern of the public and also of ethicists could be that uh, there would be something like a, a, a subtle coercion, pressure exerted on people, nudging them, not forcing them, but nudging them to ask for euthanasia. And uh, I can't deny this is a concern. And then the specter, for instance, of uh, health care costs comes into that picture. Uh, and the notion that a number of people would feel a burden on their family or a burden even on society uh, if they uh, continue to live. This is a legitimate concern, uh, but let me tell you that the experience, certainly so far, is that there is more resistance to be overcome to carry out euthanasia than there is coercion or nudging towards euthanasia. So it, 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 the, the concerns are, are rather uh, uh, the, the opposite of the reality is rather more the opposite than the concern. But it, it remains a concern, I, 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 I agree. And uh, the third point about the handicap is very important, yes. yes. Uh, for instance, you may know the philosopher Peter Singer was booed and picketed in Germany uh, when he, was, he gave lecture there because he had come out uh, in favor of, uh, well, animal rights, but also patient rights and euthanasia. Uh, yes, uh, the handicapped, I, I did not witness anything very important like this in Belgium, but uh, it is a concern. And it might <coughs> be of interest to you, those of you who, well, a few, a couple of you here were uh, in Linköping yesterday, and uh, showed other data there. We have uh, we have studied the quality of life and end of life attitudes towards the end of life among uh, patients uh, with a young colleague of mine who used my methods to measure the quality of life of locked-in syndrome patients. Locked-in syndrome, you uh, are may be aware of, are uh, people, unfortunate people who are already at a young age often have a brain hemorrhage, brain stem hemorrhage, which cuts off all motoric neuro neurological pathways. So they are locked in, they are trapped in a dead body, but their mind is intact. So they hear, they understand, they feel, they have pain, they uh, have an intact head with a dead body. So they communicate only with eyes, blinking or uh, eye movements. So this is uh, arguably the most uh, devastating uh, condition in that one can imagine in uh, among uh, the, the most severe handicap that exists probably. And so we, we investigated their quality of life and their attitudes towards the end of life. And interestingly, um, uh, <coughs> the majority of them said they had, adop uh, they had adapted and they had a reasonably happy life, the majority. But a very sizable minority were extremely unhappy. And... Uh, this, was, this study was in France, where euthanasia, euthanasia is not legal. Uh, but we have had cases like that in Belgium. 
and they have asked for and received euthanasia. One of them was a lady who had been in handicapped for three years like this, uh, in locked-in syndrome, and she requested and, re and got euthanasia, and she insisted to donate her organs for organ transplantation, making something good out of her own death. Uh, so, the handicapped uh, have no case. They have no case because no one, there's never been any uh, pressure on handicapped to ask for euthanasia, but if the, the minority of them who do wish to die can be allowed to die when the when there is a law. And they might have a point in that they might say, well, you see, if there is uh, a euthanasia and that becomes popular among the handicapped, uh, then there will be less investment of the healthcare system in good care for the handicapped. But we've seen that certainly with euthanasia, the, the, the opposite is true because there is a legal euthanasia, that is a very strong incentive to keep and to develop palliative care services. Right? Uh, I am Berit Hassemark, I am in the training. Um, uh, I wanted to ask one question. In our association here in Sweden, we are often asked if there is a place abroad where we could go to have our lives ended. And uh, of course there is Switzerland and so on. But now I wonder, have you in heard uh, foreigners, non-Belgian citizens, who have been able to go to your country and yeah. have euthanasia help mm. or not? Uh, frankly, I have not heard of it. Uh, it must occur, but you must remember there's one of the provisions of the law is that there be uh, a good, solid, lasting relationship between the doctor and the patient, right? So the patient must be known well to the doctor and the patient must repeatedly and consistently re uh, express his or her requests with euthanasia. Now that could be achieved by a, a, a tourist, right? A euthanasia tourist. But I haven't heard of this happening. Uh, although I suppose there must be a trickle of that. Uh, it's not prominent it hasn't been picked up by the by the press for instance well within the european union for instance nowadays you can go to another country and have a an operation done on the hip or something like that and have it done more quickly yeah. so i thought perhaps you could go there and uh, right. uh, <laughs> and stay for 3 months and have a good relation with one doctor. yes Yes. Would that be possible, you think? I mean, oh, yes, uh, yes. According to law? Yes, yes. Ah, there you are. Yes. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> I've never heard this before. <laughs> That's fantastic new development. We must talk about that in our association. This is really true. If there's time for one more question, since I've worked all, all my life in the insurance industry, I'm just curious, uh, in Belgium or in your neighboring countries, do you know of any uh, concerns or how they've been dealt with from the insurance industry about this moving up of the time of death? And yeah. yeah, very, yes, very legitimate question. Yes, the industry has adapted to the to the the law. Of course, uh, life insurance was invalidated when one took one's own, one's own life, but not in the case of uh, euthanasia. It's, uh, that's uh, uh, an exception. It's not considered as uh, suicide.
it's a natural death also interestingly there's not a category it's called it's natural death in the on the death certificates do we have any more questions no i think we have to go on and uh, have some coffee and a bun uh, there was one question some Oh, what was your last, what were your last words? She wanted to know what you said last there. Um, Försäkring. Ah. And, uh, jo, han sa att um, uh, ibland i försäkringsvillkoren om det är självmord så blir det ingen utbetalning. Men han säger att uh, Euthanasia, hur säger man? Euthanasia. <laughs> Läkare assisterar död. Det betraktas som naturligt död. Så att det påverkar inte försäkringsutbetalningen. Some children from Amsterdam. Ja, ja, ja.